You had a near-death experience in a skiing accident. Would you tell me how this came about and what was the backstory? The backstory is that my colleague called me to ask if we were doing another skiing day together. It was March 13, 2013, and I remember that it, that was a Wednesday. So he asked me to go skiing with him, whereupon I said, oh, by all means, yes, we'll do that. And right at that moment, I still have to add something belonging to the backstory. At that very moment when I agreed that, yes, we will do that next week or in two weeks, we'll go skiing, there was an inner voice which said to me, uh-uh, no. And this was a rather weird situation. No, don't do that. It was a kind of inner voice. It wasn't really a voice. Rather, it was a kind of feeling. I can't define it exactly. Of course, if someone says to me, don't do that, then I do it anyway. That's what I have always done, because I always meet challenges head on. But this was quite new for me, to hear something inside of me saying, no, don't do that. So the day came and we went skiing all the same, that's for sure, and that's what we agreed on. It was a beautiful day, the sun was shining, there was hardly anyone on the slopes. The slope was huge and we were slaloming down the hill and I was about the third or the fourth, every now and then I was the last, and then there was quite simply a bang, if I can put it that way. The noise was comparable to a thick wooden branch that you have in your hands, or also a skinny branch, and you break it. This was the kind of noise that I heard. And then a bright white light was there, comparable to a flash of lightning. Sometimes that also happens when you bump your head. Then you see stars, so it was really a bright light and then I just passed out. And as I said, I was the third or fourth from the last in our party, riding these slalom curves, and then there was this bang. It was caused by a snowboarder, who must have been coming at tremendous speed, and that's what was the case indeed. So he was rushing down the slope so fast that he didn't even fall over when he bumped into me. But it was I who was thrown about five meters away. And according to those who observed the accident, I was thrown about three yards into the air. And then after another two yards, I finally ended up laying on my back. How you experienced the near-death experience? Well, the moment I heard that bang, nothing happened for a while. Well, that bright light was kind of an off switch, I'll say, for the whole system. In this moment then, in which this bang took place, a feeling of without judgment came up. That is, there was no assessing I just simply saw myself lying down there, and I also saw a woman somehow to the right of me. I don't really know if maybe she intended to resuscitate me. I can't tell you. She was wearing an orange ski jacket and black gloves with orange stripes, and I could see it all easily. I also saw who else was there, and as for me, I was somehow about five to eight yards away from it all. So at that moment, when there was this bang, and when I saw the flash, also this bright light, I somehow just saw myself as well. And this was such an incredible feeling. It wasn't cold. It wasn't warm. It's just like the soul was just simply gone, however, still in place even though separated from the body that was somewhere over there. And that's an incredible feeling. Really marvelous. That's just how I would like to express it. It's just a wonderful feeling that could almost be addictive. Later on, I tried to reach this state again through hypnosis and meditation techniques. 
Well, according to the account of the sequence of the accident, about 30 or 35 seconds might have passed when there was another kind of flash and somehow an inner voice that said to me, it can't have been that yet, or that can't be it yet. There was once again a flash, and this then was a very bright flash of light, whereupon I was first of all breathing in quite normally, feeling that the breathing had started to work again, but it was actually just this suction when you breathe in. Then gradually, through the whole body, I noticed how the system, slowly at first, then picking up speed, got going again. All this coordination of the nerves, for example, and also sensing, and so on. Then I moved my feet and my hands. They were okay. Thereafter, I turned around, backwards, still wearing my helmet. And that way, I turned around to the rear. And at the same time, I asked, where do you come from? Only later, during the review of the circumstances of the accident, and so on, it has been stated that I could not have seen the person back there at all, because I was laying there with my gaze going in the opposite direction. I still had my helmet on my head, and the person was standing further away to the left and behind me. But yet I saw him. That's absolutely clear to me. I also knew that he was the one who had hit me with his snowboard on the slope. It was he who had called the rescue, and I must say that he behaved in an exemplary manner. So he, well, he was just a young fellow, about 8.85 meters tall, and weighed about 80 kilos, and I, weighing just 66 or 67 kilos, was thrown through the air. Well, now I was lying there, trying to stand up, whereupon all the pain began. On my back, my stomach, my head, I also had a dry mouth. Then this whole fear thing started. I tried to stand up, and I was helped to do so. And after walking about two, three yards, I was sagging down in my knees. And because I had such a dry mouth, I ate the snow. But I didn't sense this at all. Then the rescue service came with a snowmobile, and the plan was to put me on the snowmobile and transport me down like that because it didn't look like I had any bone fractures or the like. But I couldn't find a foothold, so I had to, once again, lay down in the snow. And then a rescue helicopter arrived with a doctor, whose first suspicions were that there might have been abdominal trauma, head injuries, and injuries on the side and back, countless bruised and broken ribs. And so I was taken by helicopter to the ICU of the local hospital. I had never flown in a helicopter before, and I was only half aware of all this, and I still had this dry mouth. I was then given a sweet, and I remember it didn't taste like anything. I had no sense of taste anymore, nothing. And I was in excruciating pain that actually only had set in after a few minutes. And so I was then crammed into this helicopter. I'll say, it's very, very cramped in there. I don't know if you know how it's like. In any case, I was then lying in a very t small corner of this helicopter. The doctor was next to me, and I was tied down. And so we flew back. And then I remember that the doctor told the helicopter pilot to fly slowly, because he was flying over these hilltops and then down steeply. That's why I somehow tilted sideways, whereupon I got a pain, and I can't say where it hurt. So she said again to the helicopter pilot 
Slow down, not so fast. Please fly slower. And he gave her a sign that he understood. Thereafter, the flight was actually quite quiet. And she pointed to her wristwatch and signaled two more minutes, then we'll be down there. Because I felt very cramped in this tiny corner and I actually needed space. However, it was surprisingly quiet at that moment. I know this situation from other accidents that I've had when I was getting restless then, but they weren't as serious as this one. Anyway, I was pretty calm at that moment, I'd say. So we arrived at the ICU of the hospital. I had to have examinations with contrast media, and I don't know what else. My cell phone was taken away, also my money, everything was taken away. But that wasn't so important. I was then in intensive care for three days with head injuries, as far as I can remember, concussion and so on. Also, because of my bruised and broken ribs, I could hardly breathe because it was all so painful. And so I was also administered analgesics that made me feel a bit better. Did you pay attention to anything other than yourself during this out-of-body state? Did you still hear or see anything else? I didn't hear anything, and actually, I only saw myself and my immediate surroundings. And what kind of impact did this near-death experience have on your future life? It has really caused a lot of change. At the time, I was training to be a mental coach, that is, a mental trainer, and everything that goes with it. In the first two to three weeks, I was actually just happy and glad that all this had had a happy ending so far, and that the person who caused the accident didn't just leave the scene of the accident, but called the emergency services. Then, later on in the training, I was confronted with a subject area where the functioning of all these meditation contexts and hypnosis techniques were questioned. Also, the many brain structures and areas, as well as the details of the beta, alpha, theta, and delta brain waves and frequencies, and so on, were being discussed. I also kept having memories of this accident where I then started to make comparisons. And I asked myself if it could be that in connection with the accident, I could have reached a state comparable to the one during meditation. And the training leader then also confirmed to me, well, of course. Also, if you consider the hypnosis and meditation technique of these Shaolin monks, how they reach their meditative states, and that's why I then, of course, got an even greater interest in this matter than before. And this was also the reason why, of course, I dealt with it also further on. And then in the Institute, I consulted with the director. I read scientific documentation, so I continued to deal with this whole story. And the more I did that, the more the memories of the accident returned. And sometimes, I couldn't find words for it, and so I was able to attach this value to that experience, you see, and place a certain appreciation on it, because I just remember this extraordinary state really well, and a feeling of warmth still comes over me when I think of it. The experience had an even greater impact on me when the director of the Institute began to take an interest in me. And thus it all started to be, and thus it all started to shape up in this way. I'm very critical in this respect, so I don't believe everyone's words, and I want to check everything more closely so that it's credible for me personally also. What I've experienced is credible for me, there's no doubt, and I wanted to bring this feeling back again to myself through the hypnosis and meditation techniques. I noticed some success indeed, and I really trained. 
And there were moments when I said to myself that if I really wanted to go back to this experience, I might possibly succeed. But realizing this was on the brink, so to speak, whereby I asked myself again, do I really want that? Considering the fact that I would have to go back into my body, which I managed to do at the scene of the accident back then. And from that point of view, I thought that also on other occasions, this should be possible. You see, this mental game. For me, a lot really changed after this experience. And I myself changed in some ways also because I had more and more unanswered questions and wanted to satiate this thirst for knowledge. It took me about six to eight months to really realize what had happened to me, for example. How could I ever see that someone was standing behind me? This was actually not possible at all. Could one say that this experience has made you a little more open to certain spiritual issues? In any case, of course, what I have told you so far is related to the first six to eight months after this accident, this process, the reappraisal, and also the processing, a time of becoming aware of what actually was going on. And in the process, I certainly found answers to many things without having to research about any other open questions. I also was looking at what happened from a scientific point of view, and there are certainly scientific explanations for this up to a certain point. But at some point, it can no longer be proven. This is somehow not yet possible. Not yet, I'll say. And how far research in this area has progressed now, I don't know at the moment. Because for me personally, I found the answers that made sense to me. There were many things that I was better able to deal with afterwards. Things like understanding toward my fellow human beings, being considerate to other people. It was just that I listened to others more. Are you still afraid of dying? No, that's again another question. But I think that sometimes life is more frightening than death. Of course, I have also thought about death, but this is then the threshold where something inside me told me very subtly, not yet. And it was not my consciousness telling me that. So I can answer you quite clearly. No, I am not afraid of dying. Thank you so much for this interesting interview. And it was a pleasure for me 